At this time, we're going to, those who are handing out the coloring sheets for the kids, you can, they're going to go around and hand those out while we get ready for the sermon. As rightly stated by our puppeteers, we are in Ephesians chapter 5. Before we move into that, though, we want to take time to uh, worship the Lord through our tithes and offerings. I say that every Sunday, tithes and offerings, and I think some people think, what is the difference between a tithe and an offering? A tithe is a the word that just means tenth, and for many people, uh, believers, they, t- they, 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 they believe that everything that they have comes from God, and as an act of worship, they set aside, in the, in the, in the Old Testament, they set aside a tenth of all that they were given, and they gave it to the Lord, they gave it to the temple as worship. The New Testament doesn't have any command that we're called to give a tenth. Uh, it's actually, if you read the New Testament, we're called to be hilarious and generous, and it's, it's, it's more than that. And, uh, but a tenth is just, a, 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 for many people, a standard way to say we're going to set aside a portion of what God gives us to give back to Him for worship and also for the support and, uh, and the work of the ministry. And... That is something that people do regularly, and you do that now, you do that. Some people do it via Ubervisen. That is an act of worship that is between you and the Lord, and, and we, you probably don't hear me teach a lot about giving and, uh, because uh, that's, if it's in the text, we preach it. If not, we're not here to try and squeeze every penny out of you. And so this is our, your opportunity as those who have that conviction to carry on the practice of giving a tithe. This is when we give that tithe during our, act of, during our time of worship. Um, or you do that alone at home. An offering is simply above and beyond what you would regularly give. God laid it on your heart to give as an offering to him, a free will offering in the Old Testament it's called. And so we still practice that today in Christ's church. Everything we give is free will, right? This isn't, uh, this isn't a tax. Uh, so... Or, or a payment. It's not a, uh, you're not paying your Verein uh, dues or something. It's a free will. And so we say tithes and free will offering, as in free will, as God's laying on your heart to give one time, or you are coming to worship God and you give regularly, however the Lord has laid it on your heart to give, we set aside a portion of our service uh, to honor the Lord in this way. The tangible way to express our trust in God, our dependence on Him, and our, our worship to him. So as the music plays, we're going to just spend some time not only giving, but also praying and to prepare our hearts for uh, for the service, for the preaching of the word. And then at the end, I will pray and uh, lead us in, in the word together, or we will get into the word together. So.
Our gracious God in heaven, we thank you for your gifts that you pour out on us. Every good thing, James tells us, every good thing that we receive comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadow. We thank you for your grace toward us. We thank you for your goodness and your provision. Lord, now as we we move to the preaching of the word, I pray that you would calm our hearts, that we would come as confessors of sin, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us, that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive your truth. Lord, I pray that you'd give me clarity. The sermon I, that I give today would be with an understanding of your intent for Christ's church, for husbands and wives. Lord, above all, may you be glorified. Be glorified in the giving, the offering that was just given. Be glorified in the songs that we sing. Be glorified in the preaching of your word, the fellowship. As we gather around the table, Lord, may your name be exalted. May our hearts uh, just pour out in love for you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son Jesus who came to this earth and gave his life as a ransom. That we can find forgiveness of sin and a restoration uh, in our relationship to you, Lord, through faith in Christ. To you be all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. This is a quick reminder, if you heard last week, we do have an app now as we're getting ready in September. Um, date I can't, no, later, out the date after, we're starting uh, this fall, we're starting TBT as in the book of uh, Exodus. And there is now an app that you can go to and download that's gonna have all of the material there, the sermons, the, the study guides, the narrative, the songs, the memory verse songs, uh, and then you can follow along with that, so we encourage that. I just have my phone out right now because I was reminding myself to put it on silent as even I am, uh, can be guilty of that. So, Ephesians chapter 5. Now, we are beginning in verse, uh, or I'm going to be preaching today from verse uh, 22 through 24, focusing on 24. That's just three verses. Uh, last week, uh, I covered... 21 verses of the first the first 21 verses of chapter 5 and that is a lot that is a lot uh, and maybe too much in one sermon and I say too much because there's a lot of imperatives a lot of commands that Paul gives in those first 21 verses uh, as a response or a explanation of the quality the character of one who is in Christ one who has experienced salvation And Paul gives us this character of a spirit-filled follower of Jesus, and then he compares it to the life characterized by the rest of the world, the ungodly. There is a difference, there is a a sharp difference between those who are in Christ, following Christ, and the rest of the world. It's um, It's not a confusion, it's not a blend, it's not some kind of gray area. There is a distinct difference between those who follow Christ and those who do not. And we broke it really down, in order to cover that much information, I broke it down into the three imperatives. And first he says to, that we as Christians were to be defined and characterized by love. And he says, walk in love. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. And then the qualifier, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're to be defined by selfless, sacrificial love. That's who we are in Christ. That's how we are to live. And then he says, walk as children of light. Walk in light. You should be a reflection of who your father is and what he finds important and his character and his desires. That we don't partake in the the things of darkness. We don't live like the world. We live like Christ. And instead of trying to blend into the world, He says we're called to expose the darkness primarily as we proclaim the gospel and call sinners to salvation. And finally, he calls us to walk in wisdom. We need wisdom to be able to walk in light, to walk in love, because we live 
in a difficult time. We've always, the church has always existed in difficult times. The world has always opposed biblical Christianity. He says, walk in wisdom, being careful to what? Discern the will of the Lord. In every situation in your life, in every circumstance, in good or in bad, you who have the Spirit of God living in you have the privilege of being filled with the Spirit to know the will of the Lord in that situation and then to obey it. Why? Why is it so important to walk in wisdom? Because the days are evil. Because the days are evil. So to summarize the first 21 verses, the Christian walks in love as children of light with wisdom filled with the Spirit to discern how we live according to God's will. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is. Praise God for the work of the Spirit in our lives. It's a life of worship, and it's defined by selfless service to God and selfless service to one another. And now from verse 22 moving on until all the way through chapter 6, Paul is now moved from giving the call to godly character to now giving us the implications of that call. How, how does living a, a life word or a God word life uh, look like in different situations? What are the implications for different people? And Paul gives three examples involving six different types of people. He talks about wives and husbands, the relationship between children and parents, and finally, servants and masters, or employees and bosses, maybe is a more accurate translation for today. Now today, I just want to focus on the implications for wives. In those first three verses of 21, or 22, 23, and 24, but in order, before we do that, I would like us to read it in context. And so, if you would stand with me, with your Bible, your Bible app open, and I'm going to begin in verse... It's hard to know where to jump in unless you just start from the beginning. Let's start in verse 15. Starting in verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord, for the, Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own body, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be his name. You may be seated.
There is no question, there is no doubt that the family, specifically God's definition, his intent for family is under attack in our world today. The, defini- the, the biblical definition, as we just read here in Ephesians 5, that a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two become one flesh, one man, one woman, for life, under God. God's, God is the one who created marriage. He's the one who, who structured it, and he has, he has the intent. It's created for a purpose, as we see here in the text. And yet marriage itself, the very definition, has been changed, has been altered, The relationship between husband and wife has been deviated from God's original intent. And in our culture today, marriage is really seen less and less as a critical or vital part of society. The media, television, it praises, it exalts individual identity and freedom above obligation and responsibility the pursuit of, of, of joy, the com- pursuit of entertainment and self-fulfillment. Today, men and women, they don't want to be hampered by the duties of, of marriage or family. It's seen as, as a ball and chain. You go to a, what do they call those here in Germany? I don't know, a stag or a the guys go out and celebrate the, you know, what do they call those? Before the guy gets married, what are they? Bachelor parties. I didn't have one, so I don't know what they're called. Uh, you have the bachelor parties, and what do they do? Oh, too bad, man. Life's about over. Live it in. It's all about to change. You're dead. I don't know what they say. Again, I didn't get one. But that's praise. That's exalted. It's even made fun of, and You begin to even feel sorry for guys who carry the obligation or women who carry the obligation of a family. It's highly looked down upon. And men and women today really don't want to be hampered by the duties and responsibilities of family. And the reality is, why should they? Why why should they take on the obligations of family and marriage when they can get everything they want from a short-term relationship without taking any personal responsibility. This is what our society teaches. Sex without any commitment is the rule of the day. One-night stands are acceptable and even in many circles congratulated. And should your escapades get you into trouble, you get pregnant, hey, You have the choice, get an abortion. Your freedom, your future, your health, it can't be hampered by one meaningless sexual encounter. This is what we hear today. Even the essence of what it means to be a man and be a woman has been redefined as kind of up in the air. No one really knows anymore. Now more than ever, We as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, must heed the warning that Paul gives here in this text. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And brothers and sisters, marriage is not defined by our culture. It's not defined by the media. It's not defined by the zeitgeist. It's not defined by you and what you think's best for you. Marriage, as God intended it, is under siege. And we must identify that. We must know what the, the biblical definition and purpose for marriage is so that we might defend it, live according to it, exalt Christ, exalt and proclaim the gospel within our relationships. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, that we as elders decided to go through the book of Ephesians. One of the primary reasons is because we see the enemy, Satan, the world, the, the rulers of this world, targeting families, not only in the church at large, but we see it in this church. Part of my ministry as your pastor is to help people and give 
biblical counseling, marital counseling. I have given more marital counseling in the last three years than I have in my entire nine and a half years combined. And the need for more people to be equipped to counsel other couples is an ever increasing, ever and grow, ever growing need. We cannot be a healthy church unless our families pursue biblical marriage and husbands and wives understand the roles that God has intended for them. That men and women, single or married, understand the role of husband and wife. Because if the families fail, it doesn't matter what we're doing here as a church, how great our program is, how great the music is, how great the preaching is. If our families fail, we fail to be the church God calls us to be. This is serious. This is important. This implication for the home is vital, not just for the health of church. It's, it's vital for the health of our society. Here's the principle from these three verses. And this is what we have to break down and understand. I would also like to say that I am not here to challenge your way of life today if you're married, to challenge whatever system or relationship that you have with your wife or your husband. I'm not here to challenge what you do. I'm here to challenge your thinking. I'm here to challenge you, take it to the word and challenge what your motives are and why you do what you do and why your marriage functions the way it does. And for you single people to help you come to an understanding and challenge your thinking on what the purpose of marriage is, the meaning of it. Because there is a high probability that if you're single, you are going to be called to marriage. And you want to go in with a, an understanding of what God's desire for you is. And not what you think or what your parents have taught you or solely what your friends tell you. And so forth. The principle here is wives live out the call to live in love, light, and spirit-filled wisdom. That's what we learned. We're all called to live with this character of love, walking as children of light, Walking in wisdom, being filled with the Spirit, what is the implication for wives? Wives live out the call to live in love, light, and Spirit-filled wisdom by submitting to their husbands out of reverence for Christ. That is how you as a wife, if you're a wife today, this is how you apply that in your home. Now that's a loaded statement. And a very unpopular thing to say. Very unpopular thing to say. Not only in society, but even in the church. You go to many places and it comes to preaching this, this passage of scripture and, you know, the pastors are casting lots. Who's going to preach this one? Yeesh. Who gets the short straw? Personally, I'm really excited to preach this. Because I want to know and you want to know what is God's design? What's the purpose for marriage? And really this phrase... Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, it wouldn't have raised an eyebrow 40, 50 years ago. It wouldn't have raised an eyebrow in the church. And today, really this word submission, submission, even as I say submission, submit, some of the hairs rise up on the back of your head. It brings thoughts of indentured servitude or women's rights, Feminism, sexism, inequality. The problem here is not with the word submit. The problem is not with the command to submit, submit. The problem is with the misunderstanding of this word. That's the problem. If you're here today visiting, we as a church believe the Bible is the authority for faith and practice. It is the inspired word of God. God inspired the Apostle Paul to write this letter and send it to the churches. And what Paul wrote simply is, wives are to submit to their husbands, qualifier, as to the Lord. God means what he says. The meaning, the meaning that, or what Paul meant then, almost 2,000 years ago, is the same meaning today. It hasn't changed. 
Society's changed, culture's changed, relationships have changed. This meaning hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. We're not, we don't get to ignore it. We don't get to reject it. We don't get to change the meaning to fit our circumstances. It's not simply an old fashioned idea that we have all outgrown. God's design and purpose for marriage are the same now as when God created the world. We must understand it. We're called to meditate on it. And by God's grace, we are called to conform to it. Now, I'd like to put in one more qualifier before we get into this. And that is, I am not saying that the church has understood this passage throughout time. This was a radical thing for Paul to say in his time. It has been a challenge to understand what does it mean for men to love their wives wives as Christ loved the church and wives submit to your husbands as the Lord. That has been the church's pursuits from the foundation of the church. Understanding, and not only understanding it, but living it out. Because it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to conform to this, to this command. But I will tell you the biblical role of the wife in the home is vital to the preservation of the family. It's, it is crucial in, underst- in the understanding of what the church is and the church relationship to Christ. It is also essential to our testimony to a lost and dying world. And so let's look at these three verses one at a time. And let's see what the Lord has for us. What does this mean? How do wives live out the character of, a, of, a, of this new life in Christ? Verse 22, what's the command? Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Again, it's a command and it's a qualifier. You're called to what? Submit. How are you called to submit? As to the Lord. What is the problem here? We have to know the understanding of submission. And to wrap our minds around this unpopular word, I want to take us back to the beginning, to Genesis. Just one verse, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. You can write it down in your your notes or make a note of it or turn there quickly. I'm going to read it to you. It's just one verse. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. A helper fit for him. And then God created Eve. The woman was made to be a helper for the man. That's what it says. A helper. Now at first glance, if you're applying this word to maybe what your grandparents, the way they lived, or when you think about um, history or even the last 30 years or in other cultures, at first glance you might think, okay, She's made to be kind of the man's servant to help make his life easier. God made Eve to help Adam, you know, keep the garden neat and clean his fig leaves. I don't know. But that's not what this is saying. That's not what God is saying in this passage. In fact, the word helper in the Hebrew, the word is ezer. We actually said this word today. We said ezer. Lord, Lord, I raise my Ebenezer. You guys think, you know what an Ebenezer is? An Ebenezer is this, uh, they, would, they would build this monument as a reminder that they can't do anything. The people of Israel, they would build this up and that you can't do anything without God's help. It's a reminder that when anything is accomplished, it's done with the help of God. This word, Ezer. It doesn't mean servant. It means that God made an indispensable partner. An indispensable partner. And really, in a much broader sense, as we look at this word unpacked throughout Scripture, the word really means support. It's support. It's help. And this is not at all a demeaning title or a second-class title. She's not lesser than Adam because she was created to be Adam's helper. It's the same title, actually, God gives himself. Did you know that? This word, Azer, helper, Psalm 33, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 72, 12, for he delivers the needy when he calls the poor and him who has no helper. 
Azer. John 16, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit helper. The G- he says the helper was going to be sent. I have to go away. I can't, unless, unless I go away, the helper cannot come. And the helper is going to guide you in all truth. So I say all this to say that this word help is not a second class role in the home. The wife is made and called to help the man fulfill what God commanded him to do. And so here's the second thing. It is important to know what it precisely the wife is called to help the man do. What is, it, what is she called to do in supporting the husband? She's not called to help do whatever he wants. She has a role to help him accomplish really something specific. To accomplish God's will for Adam, God needed to create Eve. God intended it to be this way. Wives are given to their husbands to help them accomplish God's will. That is what she is called to help do. Accomplish God's will for their lives. And what is the ultimate will of God in a marriage? It's to glorify God. It's God's glory. It's God's glory. Everything Paul teaches that he has taught us from chapter 1 up to this point, everything he teaches to the church is to be applied in the home. It's to be lived out in the context of the home. How you're to love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, bear each other's burdens, serve one another. All of those things are called to be lived out in the home. Now, how the wife accomplishes her role as the helper is going to look different in every home. We don't set a standard of what to do because every husband's different. Every wife is different. Your life circumstances are different. But the goal is the same. The wife is not there to make her husband's life more comfortable or to support him while he's off pursuing his own career or his own dreams because that's not what he's called to either. It might include work, and it does include work and careers and jobs. But it's to help support him as he leads his family to worship and make much of God. That is the role. And so verse 23, verse 22, we have the command and the qualifier. In verse 23, we have the explanation. Why is she called to help her husband and to submit to his authority, which we'll get to? Number 23, the explanation is because the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. This word head is in relationship to a body. Because we're the body of Christ. He is the head. In the home, the husband is the head. And she represents the church, the body. It is is a position of submission, but it's a position of recognizing authority. Submission to her husband comes with an understanding, with a respect for the authority, not that he deserves, not that he's earned. It comes with the respect that God has given him, because that respect is a, it comes with the fact that he's been given a responsibility. It's respect for his authority in the home. The husband's role as head of the house is a visible picture of Christ's authority over the church. The husband's authority in the home, it's, it's likened to Christ's authority in the church. Now, he is not Christ. We're going to get to that next week. CT's got a big job next week. He's preaching on the next verses following. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Good luck. <laughs> That's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing that. But the husband's here, his authority... His role in the home is likened to Christ's authority in the church. Now, our culture today, authority is a negative thing. People do not like authority. Don't tell me what to do. A a guy one time, a very successful businessman, I was like, so what what led you into starting this big business? He's like, easy. I didn't want to work for someone. I didn't like being told what to do. Okay, what enough. 
But that's, that's common amongst everyone. We don't like being told we're wrong. We don't like having authority over us. But the reality is the Bible never sees authority as a bad thing. There are bad people in authority, sure. But authority itself is a God-given thing. It's essential for living out a life of God. Recognizing the authority in our lives is essential for being obedient to God's will. Jesus submits to the authority of the Father. Jesus is God, very God. He's equal with the Father in deity, and in, but yet he submits to the role. The Father, or the Son submits to the Father. The, smir, the Spirit of God submits to the authority of the Son and the Father, and yet the Spirit of God is God, very God. There's equality of value, but there's authority. The wife submits the authority of the husband. Children submit to their parents. Employees submit to the authority of their boss. The church members submit to the spiritual authority of elders. And the citizens submit to the authority of the government. There's a thing where there's a help. You're called to be a help, but also recognize and respect the authority over you. And again, the food rule for wives, you are called to give counsel. Prayerful counsel. You are called to bring wisdom to bear. I find it interesting in Proverbs that wisdom is always referenced as a she. There's probably some truth to that too. But you're called to bring that wisdom. Now, as you live a life filled with the Spirit, you're called to share the things that God has laid on your heart with your husband concerning family matters, concerning life, neighbors, work. Your views and convictions are meant to have weight and sway in the decisions that your husband makes and needs to make. The truth that love, the truth that love is not you are promise with speaking truth. Speaking the truth and love to your husband without manipulation is your way what you want to do. Saying that you can't bring challenge this call is challenging to you wives because it first begins with are you walking in love love God in every circle it's the power of the spirit that needs to work to obey that that's what's difficult we don't get there on our own your husband is given the authority in the home you greatly influence that leadership. You greatly, in, and you're supposed to bring influence to that leadership. You are a confidant. You are an administrator. You're a manager. Living the new life in Christ means speaking the truth in love to your own husband. And and I even say this for my own for in my own life. I find it often. A strong, it's easy to speak the truth and love to the people I'm not that close to outside my family because you just it's really not love, it's just polite. We think polite and love are the same. It's not. And yet we speak maybe truth or we speak our truth, our opinion, and it's so harsh because we take for granted those who are closest to us. We take it for granted. But you're called to speak the truth and love and respect that God-given authority that God has placed over him. So verse 24, as we conclude, and we now am working to transition to our time around the table. Verse 24, the breadth, the margins of the husband's authority extends to what? All things. Everything. This is a difficult one. It's easy to compartmentalize the husband's authority in the home. Because let's face it, wives, there are some areas and subjects you're an expert on. Or more of an expert on. So how do you respect his authority when you clearly, and he recognizes and knows you know, quote unquote, know better. Now it doesn't mean that you are called to do everything you're asked. You have to, submission equals do what he says. That's not what it's saying there. Because Paul may, clearly lays it out, the margins support and help their husbands. You're not, you're not called, wife, to partake in darkness. You're called to walk in light as a child of light. So if you have a husband who's leading you in darkness, you say no. That's not what submission is. You are not called 
to participate in darkness, you're called to expose it. And you say, I can't, in loving respect, I can't participate in that. I can't agree to this because the Bible says contrary. I can't do it. She is to support her partner as they live a life for the glory of God. It means that you're given to your husband. When you get married, you're given to your husband. And he becomes that Christ-like authority. And yes, it is in all things. And everything you do is about being his helper and helping lead him, or helping as he leads, excuse me, your family to worship the Lord. Listen, marriage, the role as a wife is not meant to hold you back from anything. But again, this passage is here to challenge your motives for what you do, why you do it. This passage conflicts greatly with a large part of the modern feminist movement. The world tells you that you you need to maintain your own individual identity. You need to pursue your own career so you don't lose yourself in your marriage. Caring for the home is looked look down upon in our society. If the enemy has geniusly figured out a way to take the exalted role of the wife in caring for the home and, and making that a priority in everything she does, Proverbs 31, and they've made it a negative thing, or at least something that there should be this equal focus on or equal support. I'm not saying that men shouldn't help in the home. They definitely should. But this message is the opposite. The feminist movement, what the world tells you, it's the opposite of a Christ-centered marriage to look like. And the reason why this woman in my family, that is a, that's a selfish thought. It's not selfless, sacrificial love. That's all about you. It's not about Christ. I was talking to my wife uh, this weekend, talking about this passage, and she, she was sharing with me what the, the women's Bible study that she's uh, helping lead, what they talked about, this word love, Christ-like love. And they said they really came down to, and I thought it was beautiful, that Christ-like love is, is a decision, it's a motive, and it's an action. It's a decision, a motive, and an action. You choose to by love, and you act on love. It does say that your home is of primary concern for you. It's the primary concern. 1 Timothy 5.14 tells wives to manage their own households. You are called to be the administrator, the manager of that household. He's called to lead it, but as a helper, Paul tells Timothy that wives are to manage their households. Proverbs 31, the, 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 the Proverbs 31 woman or Proverbs 31 wife praises the wife, verse 27, it praises the wife who looks after what? The affairs of her household. In Titus chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, the older women are to teach the younger women. But what are they to teach them? How to work in and from their home. The Bible teaches that God gives wives a distinct, it's not the sole responsibility, but it is a distinct responsibility regarding the home. He made you, your children, in a way that your husband cannot connect, cannot identify with. Again, husbands, it's not saying that you don't have to contribute around the house. But it does mean that your wife is called to manage and administrate this home. You are submitting to her role, husbands, as you submit to her administration and her management how to run the household. It's a role that comes not only as a unique role as a servant leader, but you are, as wives, you are uniquely equipped to fulfill that role. And it's one more way that you model Christ-like love. You model submission to Christ. In closing, I would say this, the implications of walking in love for you wives who are here today is not a prison sentence. As it's read here and as we read about 
the call and the, the role of marriage, the purpose of marriage, displaying the submissive trust and love the church is to have for Christ, it should be a joy. It is meant to be a place of safety. Marriage is meant to be a place of trust. Again, you're not called to respect his authority and submit to that leadership or help him simply because he deserves it. Do it because, specifically to this text, it testifies to Christ's love relationship with his church. Are you pursuing that day in your life? Are you considering and meditating on what this means for you as a wife in your life, for your life and living for his glory? Now, there are a lot of questions, I think, that you could talk about in Life Group this week and a lot of discussions, a lot of, um, I would say, different scenarios. These three questions, and one-on-one, -on -one and it's for everyone. Well, that's God's decision. How do you view, do you view to be married? That's a good thing. But those motives in the way that you your husband and, and, and whether you check that authority or you challenge that authority, what are your motives behind that? I don't know what they are. Biblical understand help to you. Are you planning, are you expressing your mission, your, your desire for the things of God? How sure, there's things mechanically right towards that and I'm going to, I'm going to see how God is going to move me to help pursue that and support that vision. How has this passage challenged your understanding of submission and your relationship to your wife? That's something for reflection. As we move now to our time in around the communion table, will you bow your heads with me as I pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. We are great how from the beginning you you made woman is to is to be that and in that obedience they would come to understand how to live that they would have a biblical understanding to another peace that there be human glory. And so we Christ as their You have asked Christ into your life. And again, by in Christ today, we invite you to join. If you're here today, visit more. You're a child. You've not come to that age where you understand your sin and have called upon the name of the Lord. Uh, 